All right, let's pray before we start. God, we love you so much. And God, we thank you for the opportunities you give us um, in this life. We thank you, Father, for the breath that you give us to breathe. God, we thank you for the beauty that we see around us in your creation. We thank you, God, there's so much, if we stop in life and take a look around, there's so much to be grateful for and to give you praise for. God, this morning we're going to read a very, very familiar story, probably one of the top three most familiar stories in your word. Father, we can oftentimes read a story like this and pass it over and not look at it for the amazing um, way that you're weaving things throughout history. And God, help us to recognize that kingdoms and kings will come and go. But you are the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and you will reign forever. And so, Father, as we unwrap this familiar story, I pray that each one of us will recognize um, what it is in our lives that you want to change in us. I pray that every person will be different as they walk out of here than they were when they walked in. God, as for me, I pray, Father, that there be more of you and less of me. I pray that you'd use my words well. God, help me to say what is of you and from you. Help me to handle your word properly. And thank you for this great day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Israel was God's chosen people. Israel at one point during David's reign was the most powerful nation on the earth. They were like the United States of America 3,000 plus years ago. And they... David was in charge, and then Solomon was in charge, and Israel was, was powerful and mighty, and, and they called the shots. Like so many other nations, Israel started doing sketchy stuff. Israel started to live outside of God's will, and so God sent prophets, and God sent men and women of God to say, hey, stop doing what you're doing. Stop doing what you're doing. If you read the book of Judges, you see how Israel cries out to God, and God says, okay, I'm going to save you, and then God saves them, and then they do sketchy stuff again, and then he cries, and it's over and over and over again over hundreds of years. This pattern continues. Finally, God says, you know what? I've had enough. So there's this country called Babylon. Babylon at the time was the greatest, most powerful nation on the earth, and the Babylonians took over Israel and Judah at the time, they had now split, couldn't even get along with one another. Sound familiar? So you have Israel and Judah, and the Babylonians come in and they take over everything. And the Bible says that God gave the Babylonians victory. It said God caused all of this, God allowed all of this to happen, which, which we have to recognize that God is always in control. And so they come in, they take over, and what they do, whenever back then they would come into a nation, they would look for the brightest, sharpest, strongest, best-looking men, sorry ladies, very chauvinistic society, it was what it was, they would look for these men and they would take them out and they would groom them. They, they would find the sharpest of the sharpest, the best of the best. They would take them out, and they would teach them their language, their customs. And they would make sure that they're able to catch on to stuff. They had to be very, very smart. So Babylon does that. They take these Israelites, and one of these men happens to be a man named Daniel. Daniel, what we know about him, he was very strong. Daniel was very good looking. And Daniel was very smart. So oftentimes when we hear the story that we're about to hear, we, haven't, we don't realize what time has taken place throughout this entire five chapters of the Bible. See, it starts off with a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar ruled in Babylon for 43 years. Nebuchadnezzar had some good points and he had some bad points. He had some highlights and he had some lowlights. Nebuchadnezzar said, you know what? I'm going to build myself a really cool 
statue made of gold, and I'm going to have everyone bow down to it. Well, there was these three guys called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you've gone to Sunday school, you've probably sang songs about these three characters. And they said, no, we're not about bowing down to anybody but God, Yahweh, who we just sang about. And the king says, oh, yeah, well, we'll see about that. And he says, you know what? I'm going to throw these guys into a fiery furnace, and I'm going to make it seven times hotter than it's supposed to be. And they, the people that were throwing these guys in the furnace were getting consumed with fire because it was that hot. How would you like that job? <laughs> they throw these guys in there, and I don't know how or what this looked like, but Nebuchadnezzar could see inside. Creepy, right? He looks in there and he says, hey, didn't we throw three dudes in the fire? And they say, yeah, boss, we threw three dudes in the fire. He goes, well, uh, why are there four guys down there? And one of them looks like a god. And it says they pulled him out of the fire, right? Okay, get those guys, come out of there. So they just came walking out, you know. I think they were strutting, personally. I was, would you guys strut? I would be like, And it says this. This is what I love about the Bible. It gets so detailed. It says their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. So Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, okay, there's something a little bit different about their God than our gods. Okay. And so Nebuchadnezzar does some good stuff. He recognizes that. He gives God credit. And then Nebuchadnezzar starts to get full of himself because Babylon is awesome, right? It's like, it's awesome. They're ruling everything in Babylon, and he has a dream and says, hey, if you guys don't tell me the dream, I'm going to kill you all. And Daniel says, hold on, time out. Let me go home, and God will tell me, and I'll come back and tell you. So Daniel comes back and says, hey, this is great. It's awesome. Uh, You're going to do really well, but the thing is that you're going to get so prideful that you're going to go crazy. And so sure enough, he goes crazy. He goes crazy, and he says he's out prowling around like an animal. Says his fingernails look like eagle's talons. Pretty cool, huh? No, kind of sketchy. And he just looks like this wild beast, and he's living, and one day he looks up to the heavens, and God says, okay, your time is up, and God restores him and makes him even better than he ever was. Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, I'm getting this, I'm getting this. Then there's a guy named uh, Darius, Oh, I'm sorry, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar did some stuff where he took some of the, the uh, royal cups from Israel, some of the holy cups, I should say, from his, Israel, started partying with them, and then there was a finger writing on the wall. Isn't that cool? <laughs> See, this is what I was praying for, because you guys are like, oh, yeah, writing on the wall. I remember that in Sunday school. No, 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 no. A hand... Nobody is writing on the wall with something that nobody understands what it's writing. Carving into a wall. That is cool. <laughs> Daniel comes on and says, hey, man, uh, yeah, this isn't very good. You're, uh, you're not going to live very much longer. Sure enough, another nation comes in, and they take over. And that's when we find Darius. And this is where we come to the story. Now, oftentimes when we, look, listen, we unwrap the story of Daniel and the lion's den, we get it wrong. Because we think of Daniel like this. Now, Daniel looks to be about, what, 20 to 30, right? Okay, 20, 30 years old, 35 maybe, latest. Actually, Daniel really looked like this. That is one of our fine elders, Pat Calvin, if you don't notice. Actually, you got to go even 30 years more than that. Daniel was about 80 years old when he was in the lion's den. And it turns out, who wants to be an elder at C3? Anybody? We're looking for a new one. We have one just resigned. It's amazing. 
And so this is, this is Daniel now. He's, he's in his 80s. He's pushing 90 years old at this time. Daniel has been through a lot. Daniel has been through, he's actually been through seven different kings, or he will be through, gone through seven. The Bible mentions four, but history tells us there's actually seven kings. Some of them just didn't do much and they didn't reign very long. Seven kings that Daniel served under. They were all gone. Daniel was still there. What did I say earlier? Because God is in control, not man. So we have the story. Daniel is not a strapping young buck. Daniel is an older guy. He's in his 80s. And this is when we come to the story, a famous story called Daniel and the Lion's Den. Today's message is called The Prophet, the Lions, and the Kings. Sounds like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, huh? So what we're going to do, a little bit different, I have eight points today. I figure we got till the membership meeting, right? So I'm going to keep talking until I sit. No, I'm just kidding. I have eight points, but I'm going to go through this kind of like the story, and I'm going to unwrap the narrative that it is, right? A little bit different. You guys ready for something a little bit different today? All right. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 says this. Darius the Mede, the Mede, the Medes and the Persians are the ones who overtook Babylon, okay? Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. He appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. So the first thing we have here is the promotion. Now Daniel, remember, went from a slave to a government official in one kingdom to a government official in another kingdom to now being the second highest, soon to be the second highest person in the land. Now, Daniel, remember, was a slave of the country that you just overtook. And Daniel got promoted above not only the people of the people of the country that you overtook, but also the people of the country that overtook them. You following me? So Daniel is three tiers down status-wise, but now he is the ruler and soon to be the second in command over the entire Babylonian empire. God is the one who decides what happens, not man. You may hear me say that a time or 50 during the next 35 to 80 minutes. So what can we learn from this promotion is this. Your ability will get you to the top, but your character will keep you there. Your abilities will get you to the top, but your character will will keep you there. I know a lot of people who have great abilities and rise up very, very quickly, but also fall very quickly because of their lack of character. Because there are things that entice us, there are are, are things, Ways that we look to go, there are shortcuts that we often look to take that look good in the moment that often cost us a lot. We often get where we want to be, but we get comfortable. Anybody ever been in a situation where you or somebody you know has got comfortable where they're at? And pretty soon you start to see things start to slip. One year after his encounter, after his encounter in the lion's den we're about to read about, Daniel saw King Cyrus of Babylon, the next king. He saw them, the Bible doesn't tell us this, history does, that they allowed the Jews to go back to their hometown. Daniel had incredible influence. Back to the story, verses 4 through 9. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. (laughs) Daniel has been a politician for 66 years. 
Okay. <laughs> Try this group over here. All right. Check this out. Daniel has been a politician for 66 years. I don't think I know any non-corrupt politicians who have been politicians for more than six months. Sorry. Sorry, that wasn't very nice. True, but not nice. <laughs> Daniel was a politician for 66 years. And they're looking, thank you. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> but they could not find anything to criticize or condemn. Listen. If you want to find something to criticize or condemn me about, you won't have to look very far and very long. Now, do I have sketchy, sketchy stuff in my past? No. Do Am I doing sketchy, sketchy stuff right now? No. But you can find some things to condemn me about. I'm not this good. I don't know anybody in the world that I've ever known that is this good. Daniel was a man who was, when we talk about this a little bit later, who was chosen and picked by God because Daniel came through over and over and over again. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in the connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. You kiss us. <laughs> we are all in agreement. Hold on. Are we all in agreement? Is, isn't Daniel part of the we? Hmm. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the, thir for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So, the ki so King Darius signed the law. Now we have the plot. I'm going to tell you something that may come as a surprise. People are not always happy with your success. People are not always as happy about things good that happen in your life as you are. We have a term for them. We call them haters. And it usually looks something like this. Hey, did you hear? No, I didn't hear. I got a promotion. Oh. <laughs> Good for you. Yay. Yippee. People are not always excited when you have successes in your life. There are people who you hang out with that may have the same lifestyle that you know is not right that you have. When you get out of that lifestyle and you say, hey, guess what? I'm out of this lifestyle now. I, I have, I'm allowing God to change me from the inside out and get rid of these things in my life. I'm moving on from these things. I quit this. I quit that. I'm no longer doing these things. God is helping me. And they're not always going to be happy for you. As a matter of fact, they might not want you to be out. They might want you to come back in. People are not always that excited about your successes in life. And this is the plot. 120 leaders. Daniel was put in charge of them. He was one of three. He's the slave guy of the slave, right? He's a slave of the slaves. And he's one of the three. All right. We're not really feeling that, but okay. And then now he's going to be in charge of everybody, including these two guys. Okay, now you've gone too far. Ain't no slave boy telling us what to do. Let me ask you a question. Let's look at it from this point of view. How do you feel, be honest, how do you react and how do you feel when other people have success? How do you feel when people who are close to you that maybe work with you have more success than you? 
How do you feel when people that you're investing in and maybe people that you've raised up and mentored, now they're coming up and maybe they have more status, more promotions than you? Do you feel joy for them or do you feel bitterness for them? Be honest. Because if it's the latter, there's a problem there. We should always be people who have a heart for others to succeed. One of the things that I love most is watching people succeed. One of the things that brings me the most joy in my life is I was a youth pastor for like five years and then off and then another year and a half, so six and a half years total. And I love to see the young people that I helped in their spiritual growth to now be leaders in the church. Nothing brings me more joy than that. And I hope that they have a church 10 times better than I ever dreamed of having. And that's the way we have to be. We have to be people who are for people's success, not against people's success. Because what that comes out of is it comes out of insecurities. And insecurity is always ugly. Back to the story. So Daniel, this is a short reading. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he got scared and he shut his windows and he went into hiding and he prayed in his basement. When Daniel find, oh, go back. I was kidding about that. <laughs> Poor Brittany. He's like, what the heck's he reading? What version is this? Is he speaking in tongues? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. So now we have the perseverance. We got the promotion, we've got the plot, now we have the per perseverance. The first thing he did was they tried to find fault with his character. They couldn't do that. So what do they do? They go to what they know he would never give up. See, for Daniel, they weren't only asking him to commit a sin. They were asking him to omit a lifestyle. Oftentimes, we get mad about stuff after the fact. This is one of my biggest pet peeves about us as a people and, frankly, as Christ followers. We get angry when there's no more prayer allowed in school, which I agree. But my question is, how much were we praying in school before that? How often were we going to the schools and asking if we could lead a prayer group? How often are we even praying with our own children at home? And so we often get in this thing where Daniel could have said, oh, forget that, I'm going to go out. And no, no, no. Daniel didn't do anything different. Daniel didn't make a statement. Daniel didn't go out and protest. Daniel did the same things he always did. The same things he always did. He went out and he went to look towards Jerusalem. The reason why he looked towards Jerusalem is because he always prayed for Jerusalem to come back, for the people to be able to come back as a nation. So he's praying over his native nation. Doesn't say Daniel did something defiant. Doesn't say Daniel led a big giant group of protesters. Doesn't say any of that. It just says he did what he always did. The perseverance. Daniel 6, 11 through 18. This is where it gets good. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone divine or human except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den? Don't these guys just make you sick? Aren't they just little weasels? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Uh-oh. Then they told the king, the man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you, liars, and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. What it actually says here is it was, he was angry with himself. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel 
out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. Wait a minute, isn't he like a pagan king? Isn't he like a king? Interesting. So listen to this. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seal of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Hmm. No person could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. So now we have the predicament. When you allow your ego and your pride to rule you, bad things will happen. When you allow people to know that, you know, all I got to do is say some flattering things about him, all I got to do is kind of stroke his ego a little bit, and I can get what I want. When you put yourself in that position, you are in a position to fail. See, what has happened is, in this culture, you have a king who is looked at as a little g-god, like a mini-god. So they're looked at as royalty, but also like deity. You're, you're like a, a little god. You, you have a special deal with the big gods, plural. They had a lot of different gods that they prayed to. And so you're hearing from the big gods because you're a little god. Make sense? Yeah. I mean... Shouldn't, but that's where they were at, right? So you're hearing from the big gods, and you're making a decree based on what you've heard and understood from the big gods, because you're a little god. And guess what? If you go back on your word, that means you didn't really hear from the big gods, and that means you're not really a god, which means we're going to question your leadership, and which means you may no longer be king anymore. Now, If Darius was a man of integrity and principle and character, he would say, hey, I made a mistake, and I didn't hear from anyone. I just let my ego get a hold of me. But you know what? He didn't do that because he cared too much about his status and too much about his own safety. So now we have the predicament. You notice how these guys say things like, he's ignoring you. He, he's not paying attention to you. They are doing everything they can to paint Daniel in a bad light. When you allow your ego and you allow your, yourself to get in the way, you're going to find yourself in some fr- pretty bad predicaments. Back to the story. Daniel 6, 19 through 23. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, He called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Why would he think that Daniel would be saved? I mean, you throw someone into a den of hungry, roaring, flesh-eating lions, why would you even check the next day? Wouldn't you think someone would have had to come and tell him? See, he knew. He already knew. He had seen Daniel's character. He had seen Daniel's God come through several times. He knew that there was something special about Daniel's God. Amen? Daniel answered, long live the king. Daniel is so far better than I will ever dream of being. You throw me into a bunch of hungry lions and a stinky den full of with lions... And God takes care of me? I guarantee you the first thing I'm not going to say to you is long live the king. As a matter of fact, if it's me, I'm probably going to go, Daniel, are you okay? (laughs) Daniel, are you down there? (laughs) And then when I finally speak, I'm going to say something like, I can't say that in church, but I would say something not very nice to somebody who threw me into a den of lions. 
Once again, Daniel's character is above reproach. Listen to Daniel. My God, no credit to me, my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. Dang, this guy's a stud. And I have, I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the lion's den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Next thing we have is the preservation. God will do the impossible in your life when you're faithful. The problem is we, speaking as a whole, me included, oftentimes we have weak faith. When, when we are faithful, when we're faithful, God will do the impossible in your life. Bless you. Oftentimes, uh, you guys have heard this story, oftentimes if you've been here, um, but I'll never stop telling it because it is the biggest miracle I've ever seen in my life. And I've had a lot of miracles happen in my life. The fact that I'm up here, that's a big miracle. But this is even bigger than that. My dad was the meanest, most combative to the gospel person I'd ever known in my entire life. Ever. You would start even talking about God, and my dad would say, oh, I don't give talk about that God bleep bleep stuff to me, right? My dad had some expressive grammar. Um, and my dad would not allow anyone even to speak into his life. He would not go to church, not even on Easter and Christmas. And my dad loved to come home and talk about Christians he knew at his work. He would look for them, and he would talk about how bad of workers they were, how much they abused and stole from the company. He would love to say, ah, yeah, see? See what they are? Ah, that's a bunch of hogwash. My mom, who is unfortunately now struggling with Alzheimer's disease, she's been diagnosed about four years ago. She's at a point now where she doesn't recognize any of us, and it's just not a good situation. Um, but my mom is the greatest person I've ever known in my entire life. When you look at my mom's journals, my mom would start every journal this way. My mom had tens of 20, 30, we found all kinds of her journals. Every one of them started this way. God, you are amazing. I love you, praise you, just worshiping and praising God. And then right after that, every time, God, please change Gary's heart. That's my dad. Please Gary, change Gary's heart. Help him to receive you as, as his Savior. Every time, every entry, the same way. My mom faithfully prayed for my dad. Faithfully. All the time. We as kids used to ask my mom, why do you even do that? Why? Why do you even pray for him? He's so mean to us. And we didn't like it. My mom used to always say, you will forgive your dad. If you don't forgive your dad, it's going to hurt you. My mom would never say anything bad about my dad. She would never encourage us to hate my dad. She always encouraged us to forgive. So fast forward, about two and a half years ago, my dad had a, I won't go into detail, but he had a very bad thing happen to him. And his heart was, it was a miracle that he was even able to get to the hospital, much less to get to surgery. So it was a miracle he got to the hospital, and they said, hey, you know what, chances of him getting through surgery are not good. He got through surgery. Chances of him recovering are not good. He recovered. My dad smoked Camel unfiltered cigarettes since he was 18 years old. Just all the time. And he just <laughs> terrible health. My dad lived through all this stuff. My dad is literally on his deathbed. And I asked my dad, Dad, do you want to receive Jesus? Waiting for the same course, hard. And my dad looked at me and went, I prayed with my dad. My dad came to Jesus. Two months later, three months, he couldn't talk. Three months later, my brother was down there, and my dad said, hey, you're a pastor, right? And my brother said, yeah, I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> Same thing. And uh, my dad says, I want to I say the prayer. I want to make it official. I want to be a Jesus guy. You guys are sitting there going, oh, that's pretty a pretty cool story. You guys have no idea who my dad was. If you could just see a glimpse of him, you're saying, that guy's never getting saved. But see, God rewards faithfulness. And when we continue to be faithful, God will, will, will come through for us. It's not always in the way that we think 
he's going to come through. Because you know what? For every Daniel, there's an Isaiah who was sawed in half. For every Daniel, there's a, a Peter who was hung upside down on a cross. For every Daniel, there's a Paul whose head was cut off. But you know what? When you continue to be faithful, God will continue to go to you. And when you are faithful for a little, with a little, he'll be faithful with a lot. It's kind of like this. Um, I need a volunteer, someone who's somewhat athletic, semi-athletic, someone semi-athletic, semi-athletic. Come here up here, Jacques. I want to tell you guys what a great dad, what a great pops, my, my adopted daughters call me pops. I am. I was going to embarrass, embarrass Marissa's friend TJ today, but I'm not going to do that. I was going to have him come up here, but I'm not going to do that, Marissa, because I love you that much. She's so mad at me right now. All right, so, so what happens is, is when you play sports, you're going to get the ball sometimes, and you got to catch it. Well, just throw it back. You gotta, you gotta catch the ball. Otherwise, if, when you catch the ball, guess what? They're gonna, they're gonna throw it to you again. And you catch it again, and guess what? They're gonna throw it to you again. But then, I'm gonna have somebody, Krista, my daughter, Krista, please stand up. I can predict this has been her whole life. When you have. Like, Krista, stand over there, Krista, a little bit further away. Okay, when you have someone where you throw them the ball and my daughter is ultra talented. This has been since she was three. She cannot catch. Okay, now I want you to do what you used to do, okay? You're getting better. I want you to show them just for a second what you used to do. You ready? Show them how you used to do it. When you throw someone the ball and they don't catch the ball and you have an option and you're going like this, you're like, and you're going to throw the ball over there every time. So when you're over and you're in trouble and you're like, man, I need somebody. I'm like, I need somebody to, you're going to throw the ball over there every time. Why? Because you've shown that you can catch the ball. Okay, you take that home and practice. Good job, you guys. Thank you, Jock, for catching it every time. Thank you, Krista, for missing it every time. Okay, here's the point. In your life, there are going to be things where you're going to be tested. There are going to be times when the ball is going to come to you. And when you drop the ball every time... Things are going to stop coming your way. You're going to stop having those opportunities because you can't be trusted. You're not faithful. But when you catch the ball in the little things and when you do the little things right and you show the character, then God's going to recognize, you know what, I can trust you. I can do something with you. I can use you to be great. Catch the ball. Be Jacques and not Krista. Just kidding. Just kidding. You guys, she sings like an angel. She's got talent. Don't she gets doted on. I'm so nice to her. Anyway, the point is this. You have to be faithful in the little things. You have to be faithful in the little things. God will use you in the big things. So as I said, for every preservation, for every lion's den escape, there are probably ten times when people don't get rewarded, don't get preserved. Um, one of John. John's apostles, his name was Polycarp. He was 80 plus years old. And they had him on a stake. And they had the fire getting ready to be lit. And they said, denounce your Jesus. That's all you got to do. Denounce your Jesus and we'll let you go free. You know what he said? For 80 years I've served God faithful and he's never let me down. Why would I turn against him now? So I would love to say that they tried to light the fire and it didn't light. I love to say that he went up to heaven in a poof of smoke. But you know what? They lit the fire and he got burned at the stake. So what we do in those situations, it's important that we have what I call kingdom thinking and not earthly thinking. See, what Paul said was this. Paul says, you know what? To live is Christ and to die is gain. 
So kill me, I don't care. So as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to be telling you and anybody else, you ever read the stories about Paul in jail? He drove the prison guards crazy. All he would do all day long is talk about Jesus. Hey, you know Jesus? Hey, you need to know him. Hey, you need to know Jesus. You know what he did? He rose on the cross. He, he would just constantly tell these, and they're just like, oh, my gosh, shut this guy up. <laughs> to live as Christ. While I'm here on this earth, I'm going to be talking about Jesus. I'm going to be doing the work of Jesus. And you know what? You kill me, guess what? That's going to be even better because I'm going to be with Jesus. Yeah. Do you have that type of mentality? Because if you do, when you put yourself in that situation, nobody or nothing can hurt you. Daniel 6, 24. This is the worst part of this entire narrative. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Now you have the punishment. You know what, to be honest with you, I don't like consequences. I wish... We live in a world where there was no consequences. I do. But you know what? When we do things, there's always consequences for the things that we do. And it may not come right away, but it will come. And these are consequences for you. And you look at the worst part about this is the innocent. The innocent are affected by this. It says there's women and, women and children back in that time. They said, you know what? We killed the whole family. Otherwise, they will start a revolt against us because they're going to be mad that you killed their parents. And they'll start a revolt. So, you know, we're going to kill the entire family. That's just the way they did it. And it's just terrible. But, you know, there's always consequences to our sin. When we make poor choices, there's always consequences. Daniel 6, 25 through 27. This is my favorite part. Then King Darius sent the message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Remember, they're in charge of everything now. They're the biggest empire on the planet. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Now we have the proclamation. Listen, when we're faithful, people notice. When you're faithful, people notice. When you do things well, people notice. And see, people may not be able to judge your Christianity. Maybe they don't even recognize what Christianity is supposed to be. But they can always judge your character. People can always judge your character. Every person knows whether they could be in the middle of a lie, but they know a lie, and they know a liar. They could be in the middle of gossip, but they know what a gossip is. And people outside that we're trying to reach as Christ followers are always looking at you. As soon as you say, I'm a Christ follower, people are looking at you. Now, are you going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But you know what? We need to be men and women of God. We need to be men and women who live a life of godly character to the best of our abilities and allow the Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts and guide our minds and guide the way that we treat people. And when we do that, people notice. And when people notice, they start talking. When people start talking is when God gets glorified. My second favorite verse in this whole thing is this. It says this, the very last verse of this, of this um, chapter. It says, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. I wonder what, so now we have the prosperity. I wonder what prosperity looks like in this situation. Because I thought about this, Daniel lived only about three more years after this. Daniel died three years later after the lion's den deal. So Daniel lived in a palace. He was handpicked. He was chosen. He had all the choice food he wanted. He was second in command in the largest nation on the earth. And it says he prospered. I wonder what prosperity means. What this, is, what this word means here, more, it, it, what, what it means more is peace more than prosperity. Daniel lived peacefully. 
without fear, without worry, without concern for the rest of his life. This week we had, um, it seems like every week I'm up here talking about something else that has gone terribly wrong in our nation. This week we had a person who just decided to unload and shoot and kill over 50 people and hurt hundreds more. And what was very unique about this situation is they can't find a motive. There's no religious affiliation. There's no past history of violence. There's no um, radicalization. There's, there's none of that. Nobody can figure out why he did what he did. His siblings, his family, they're all like, we don't know. We have no idea what happened. Why he did that? We, everyone's baffled. Nobody understands why. And as I was praying about this this week, and when it first happened, I, first I felt this, you know how you just feel that sick feeling in your stomach? I just felt sick. I felt nauseous. I'm just like, what? What is going on? And then I felt anger. It's just like, how could you? What's, what's wrong with you? How could you just do that to innocent people? And then I felt sorrow. I felt sorrow in my heart and my soul. And I thought about this. I sat for 25 or 30 minutes, and I tried, and I prayed, and I tried to think about what my life would be without Jesus Christ. Most of the people in this room are Christ followers. I've been a Christ follower since I can remember. I've always had the Holy Spirit in me. I've never known, I don't know what it's like to live without God in me, as part of me. And so I try to think for a moment. I try to think about lonely times I've had in my life. I try to think about calamities that have happened in my life. And how I would have handled them differently if it wasn't for Christ in me. Have you ever thought about that? If you're a Christ follower... Sometimes sit and think about what your life would be without Jesus because there's nothing we take for granted more than being sons and daughters of the Most High King. And I'm speaking for all of us. Think about what that means. Just sit sometimes and think about what it would feel like to not have Jesus in my heart, in my life, and the Holy Spirit guiding me, what that would feel like. Because if you do, it gives you not a clear understanding at all, but a better understanding of how people can have such dark souls. And when you have an empty soul and a dark soul, it is an imminent enemy's playground to do evil. So today as we, as we close, I want to ask a question to every person in this room. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Have you invited him to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Because let me tell you, this life is hard with Jesus. This life is impossible without him. And so I want to, as the band comes up, I want everyone to close your eyes, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to think about that, that question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you received him as your personal savior? I want everyone just to, I know everyone's ready to go and leave. I want everyone just to, to sit and be still for just a moment, please. And I want you to think about that. Because maybe your life is, is good right now, but there's going to come a time where you need something bigger and greater than yourself. There's going to come a time in your life when you need God and you're going to have to rely on him. And today I want to give you the opportunity to start that journey. 
The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. Let me be clear that saying a prayer doesn't save you, but it's definitely a start. It's a heart issue, and you're revealing a heart issue. So I'm going to have everyone in the room repeat this prayer after me. At the end of the prayer, I want to ask you to do, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, is raise your hand. So everyone repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I'm lost without you. I need you in my life, in the good times and the bad. I accept you as my Lord, and I accept you as my Savior from this day forward. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to lift your hand up, look me in the eye, and put your hands back down. This is your opportunity. It's between you and God. There's no one else, just you and him. Don't worry about what anyone else is thinking or saying. This is just between the two of you. Now wait just a minute. God has called you to this place today. You're not here by accident. You're here for a reason. Anybody, I'll wait just a second. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you want to start this journey with God, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand. Put your hand back down. Anybody? God, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, God, for allowing us to have relationship with you. We thank you, Father, that you have wrote out a narrative in your word for us to learn from and to grow from, that you've put people like Daniel in the Bible and you've, you've told his story so well so that we can learn from it. God, this is a great, great illustration of ways that we should aspire to be more like you. If there's any man in the Bible that was like you, Father, it's definitely him. So I pray, Father, that when we read these stories and we read these narratives, that we would not just breeze past them, God, that we would allow you to show us and change us and shape us and mold us. God, I pray that every person in this room will feel that peace that Daniel felt for the last three years of his life, the peace that passes understanding. God, we love you and praise you. We thank you for the gift of today. God, may we go out and be lights into this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen.